Yeah. I'm going to do a quick roll call in the beginning. Well, we have a quorum. Right? We have a quorum. Yeah. yeah, I meant for the. Uh, oh, the rest of mm -hmm. it. I think it was 7.30. No, Bobby's on. He's new to 7. He said he was on his way. Great. It, the time is 7 o'clock, and we'll now call this uh, special joint meeting of the Board of Selectmen and the Brownfields Redevelopment <coughs> Focus Group uh, to order here. Uh, I'm going to do a r quick roll call because there's a lot of members of the, the Brownfields group. And so I see um, for Board of Selectmen members, we have John Dillon, we have Ralph Sampano, we have Sean Manning, and Ryan Curley is... Um, is Selectman Hernandez online? Yes. All right. Oh, hey, Mike. Hello. Hello. All right, so I'm just going to go through the Brownfields Redevelopment Focus Group real quick. Um, Angela Resco. Oh, hi, Angela. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Uh, Don Bascom. Hi. You here? Uh, Malcolm Beeler. No, Malcolm. Uh, Bill Caffrey is here. Kitch Zernicki? No Kitch. Uh, Joe Dinegar? Uh, no. Janet Ellsworth? Uh, Melissa Felter? Here. Yes, she is. Oh. Hi, Melissa. Um, Susan Fiedler? No. April Graves? Yeah. Hi, April. Yeah. Carrie Click? No Carrie. Tim Lavoy. No. Uh, hi, Tim. Sharon Peters. No, Sharon. Greg Piazza. Howard Rosenbaum. Norm Ward. He's here. Bob Wilderman. He's here. Frank Winiski. Ian Witchy. And Michael Rang. All right, great, thank you. Um, and uh, Bob Petzold, the chair, could not be with us this evening. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our, our guest of the evening, uh, Amy Valancourt. Amy is with Ty and Bond, and uh, Ty and Bond has been helping us uh, with this bid, uh, this, this entire remediation process. So thank you for coming tonight, Amy. Thank you. And I'll just let you know when I need the slides advanced. Thank you. I'll lower this. I'm a little height challenged. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to try to go through my slides pretty quick so we can get some questions in. And I hear uh, UConn men are playing tonight, so I will make it quick. <laughs> and so if you want to advance the first slide. Okay, and run the presentation. Okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about the Brownfields project on Brownstone Avenue. And I know that we have some people that have seen me a dozen times. I'm providing an update here. And you'll probably recognize some of my slides because I cannibalized those 12 presentations to put this together for you. Um, I am going to dive a little bit into the history because I know there are some new people here tonight and may not have been at the previous um, presentations. So how we got started with this project and um, uh, it was really about economic development, right? So we had the stagnant properties, three properties contiguous 
that created a, a great landmass with lots of potential for redevelopment. And um, it was owned by an estate, and it had been on the market since 2009 with no development interest. And that mainly focused around the environmental issues on the property. And so working with the town to look at the economic and community development that could be um, driven by cleanup and redevelopment of these properties. This is an important piece because it's part of a bigger puzzle. You have the Brownstone Discovery Park across the street and you have your beautiful Riverfront Park which is um, used by many community members with all the functions and events you have there. It's, um, it, it's a great centerpiece to tie all this together. And you can go ahead and advance. Okay, so historic land use. All of the properties were industrial. At the beginning of time, I say that, 1885, everybody here knows they were used for brownstone quarries. Historic landmark over there because of that. Um, they became bulk storage petroleum and asphalt batching plants in the 1950s. And so we had industry with brownstone discovery where they were using, uh, sorry, with the um, brownstone quarrying where they were using the site for stone cutting, R3 parcels. They were part of the co stone cutting and loading onto the ships. Um, when um, the bulk storage petroleum started, they put in tanks on the properties and then they started asphalt batching so they were um, using all three properties for that. And they operated as a bulk storage petroleum facility on 248 until 2010. And then the facility was decommissioned. And that was called Port Oil at the time. You can go ahead and advance. Thank you. And I'm going to blow through a couple slides showing you just photographs of what it used to look like and what it was back in the day. These are from from some previous presentations we did. And you can advance. Yeah. These are Sanborn maps, hand-drawn Sanborn maps. This one happens to be from 1889, and we superimposed it over an aerial photograph. So you can see that they had railroad tracks on there. They had some lifts, some hoists, and then all of the stone cutting equipment. Again, we're into 1924, still used for quarrying operations. The operations expanded a little bit. Um, they started building structures over there where they had powerhouses and things like that. And go ahead, advance. Then we go to 1957. By 1957, it was bulk storage petroleum. You could see the tanks on there. 248 is the northern property that was Port Oil. The middle property was occupied by Connecticut Tar and Asphalt. They had Amosite Corporation. And way back in the day in this photo, it was Chevron and Red Wing Oil. Okay. And then 1963, you can see it's pretty much how it was, you know, two years ago with the tanks there. Um, they had some structures, and there were tanks on the middle property, which you don't see now. Go ahead. So we put together a timeline. Every time I did a presentation here, the timeline got a little longer. I almost didn't fit it on the page, right? 2013, we started. The town funded their own environmental site assessment. We came out and we did a phase one. That's like a paper history of the property. It tells you what the land use was, where the, you, know, you have tanks, you, you um, look for the areas of concern that might have a potential for a release. We applied for a grant and it was awarded. So that was 2014, the town received $200,000 to keep investigating, to collect soil samples, determine you know, what the contamination was and the extent of it. So um, we took in 2015, um, we did a phase two site assessment, we did a hazardous building materials study, and then we put together a preliminary cost evaluation for remediation because there was another round of funding coming up and we wanted to see if we could get cleanup funds. 
what we worked with, Time Bomb worked with the town to say, hey, if you're gonna acquire this property, let's get funding in place for you to clean it up and let's get you some liability protection through the state before you become owner. And so that's what we did. We worked through the timeline here. We negotiated with the property owners. In 2019 is when you purchased the property. We had secured the grant for cleanup. We had secured the liability protections for the town. And so I'm just looking at the slide here, make sure I catch everything. Um, the focus group came along 2019 and uh, we started working with them. They are tasked with helping um, develop a vision for what the properties could be in the future. And then um, along the way of doing the site assessments, we had a couple spots on 222 um, that had contamination that would have prevented Brownstone Discovery Park from using that as the parking come May when they opened in that year. So twofold, we wanted to get them running and open because we know the town relies on the revenue from that. We wanted to make the people safe that we're gonna occupy that. And we had the resources with DPW to save our cleanup funds and they were gonna come help us with the excavation. And thanks to a local company, Red Tech, they helped us with the soil disposal. So the cost was minimal for that effort. We were able to open, uh, let Brownstone Discovery Park use that come May. Then what we did, COVID came, right? COVID came <laughs> and we were trying to um, keep the project moving forward. Um, there was an opportunity at one point where I said, hey, let's try to do a yard sale, we called it a yard sale, where we offered during the time of COVID the equipment to any bulk storage petroleum facility that wanted to come and take it, any scrap metal facility that wanted to come and take the metal, but they had to do it for free at no cost to the town, thinking they would collect the scrap metal and um, recycle it for money and that would be their payment. And we got Connecticut scrap metal to come in and they did the work at no cost to the town. And I'll show you some photos of that as we go along. Um, so we got the tanks down, which was great. It started to, the property started to look better, more open. And then we worked on the final remedial action plan for the site. And we worked with that, we had DEP come down and we ran through it with them and we were all on the same page and we submitted that in. We put together bid specs and we went out to bid. And so, although I'm gonna go through in the next slide some aspects of this, my goal by the end of this is have you up to date to where we are right now. So you can go ahead. All right, so this is a map from the phase one and as I said, we went along on the property and we identified the areas of concern. Tanks, a former pump house, um, you know, oil storage, whatever um, was a concern. We had it mapped, we had a description of it. And then we went in on the next slide and we started our soil samples. So if you go ahead and advance, yeah. And so here you can see our sampling points. We did 108 soil borings on the property, sampling the soil. We did 23 test pits and we put in 25 wells. So we had good coverage. We had an idea of how much contamination was there, what kind it was, and then we put together an updated cost on what that would be for remediation. Some of the challenges, oh, um, so this slide here represents the opinion of probable cost we put together in 2016 for the property. This is what we based our grant request on, $750,000 for cleanup. You can go ahead and advance. Some of the challenges we had on this particular site, because it was used for asphalt, tar, petroleum, we had to try to determine whether it was an actual petroleum release or if it was just layers of tar that they laid down over time, they filled with excess tar, um, asphalt, and it was sometimes three feet deep. 
four feet deep, different layers. So the property was filled dramatically over time. This mapping over here, if you can pick out, and I'm just going to point it for you. The brown layer on your side where it says 8F, that is soil mapping in the state of Connecticut. That's our official soil map. And it's depicting that um, we know that there's artificial fill. It's on both sides of the river. Middletown has it and Portland has it. So fill was added to make more land over time over there, raise it you know, up, um, be less uh, flood in that area. What, so again, we had to determine what was actually a release of petroleum and what was just tar asphalt placed, and it's very hard with the soil borings in a two inch hole. That's why we went into test pits and we were able to determine that's not a release, that's tar. And there's exemptions that we can get and we can place especially with this artificial fill already mapped, something called the widespread polluted fill um, variance that we can get, which says if you have widespread polluted fill where you can't uh, feasibly go and excavate it all out, it's your whole riverfront there, um, you can get this widespread polluted fill exemption from DEEP. And so, we knew the contamination, the levels, and we had to determine what can be capped under our current state regulations and what actually had to be excavated. <coughs> and if you were gonna cap it, you're in a floodplain. So adding fill on top of fill as a cap for a floodplain isn't always the way to go. It's a lot of permitting, a lot of cost, and sometimes you're not even able to do that. And then to remediate all three parcels with available funding. So our original OPC, our um, opinion of probable cost in our grant was for 750. Here we are in 2021. So we're talking inflation. Um, in the time of COVID, costs going up for everything across the board. And how are we gonna get all three parcels remediated with available funding? You can go ahead. So in working with, uh, you know, LEPs at Tie and Bond, which means licensed environmental professionals, and um, we basically um, have a license where these sites, these type of sites are delegated to us, and we oversee it as if we are DEP overseeing it. We um, understand the regulations and what they allow uh, for contamination, soil, and groundwater. So our plan with DEP and even back to 2016 was to cap, to cap and render the polluted fill, contaminated fill inaccessible. <laughs> and this is, I don't wanna get technical, I'm trying not to get technical, but DEP allows you to cap those uh, type of impacts in soil. And um, we have on 230 some PCBs and they're related to a slab that's remnant there that had the six tanks on it. That's the middle property. And the PCBs can be related to paint, and that's what we originally thought. PCBs leaching out of the paint that was on the tanks impacted the concrete. And then we started to find it around the pad. So it either spread or the fill material that was placed on the site in this area had PCB impacts. DEP will allow impacts to be capped in place when the PCBs are 10 parts per, under 10 parts per million. And so that was our plan because that's what we have. We're gonna cap in place, make that inaccessible to prevent any exposure to that. And engineered controls. So one of the things with an engineered control is it automatically, you know, you're preventing people's exposure to that and working with DEP showing them the bank along the river. Now that was made, and I'm gonna show you some photos of that, where they stacked the brownstone and then filled against it. So they're using that, uh, allowing us to use those existing conditions on that vegetated slope on those properties to render that soil inaccessible. And so we're using that provision too out of the remediation standard regulations that DEEP has. 
and recording of environmental land use restrictions. Um, we knew from the beginning that to clean this up to a residential standard was going to cost a lot more. We knew that um, ultimately the driver for these would likely be commercial in, you know, in nature anyway. So we planned an environmental land use restriction that would say, A, you can't do residential, you can do commercial. And B, here are the areas that we had capped and don't disturb the cap unless you, know, unless you had something to do. You were redoing the pavement or if you had a utility there and had to fix the utility, those would be provisions you could work under. And um, excavation of petroleum impacts. Now, out of the three properties, 248 Brownstone Ave is the one with the most significant contamination. That needs excavation. There were releases from the tank that migrated through the soil, and I'll show you the map that kind of depicts the limits of that. And groundwater. So groundwater, it has some impacts from the petroleum, but they're not all that bad. And so in discussing with DEP, they're saying, okay, clean up the soil, excavate the grossly impacted soil that you have to, and watch monitor the groundwater over time. And if it's clearing up through monitored natural attenuation, I can demonstrate compliance for the site with the state regulations through that. Otherwise, we have the option to do this additional calculation, some groundwater calculations. It's going to show that it gets diluted. And where it goes to in the Connecticut River, the dilution's so great, we're able to calculate another um, criteria that DEP will accept. And all of these things we met at the site, and in fact, we had an impromptu Board of Selectmen meeting at the site with DEEP to go over all of this. And you can go ahead. So these are um, maps that came right, of, right out of our remedial action plan. So the pink on 220, this is 222 Brownstone Ave. The pink is where we're gonna cap. So we're gonna go in, we're gonna use pavement, or we're gonna use soil, and along the um, bank where the blue is, that is gonna be our engineered control. So the slope is already built up, as you can see in the photo, maybe you can't, it's a little small, but it's brownstone stacked, it's beautiful. Um, but you know, it's not conducive, it's too steep for people to be walking down there. Um, so it itself serves as an engineered control. And I know that the focus group has talked about doing a river walk, and we'll talk more about that as we move on to the redevelopment. Go ahead. Next one is 230. Again, the pink is we're capping in place. I drew a box around the slab because when I brought my engineers out there and we were talking about paving, creating parking for brownstone discovery, they were saying you might want to remove that slab because it sticks up. Right? Again, filling in a floodplain, we might not be able to do that. So we are looking at maybe taking out the slab, but keep in mind it has some PCB impacts. So I drew around that as an area of possible excavation. And you can go, oh, wait, before you move forward, go back one. Look at the slope here. So it's a little more gradual stepping out with the brownstone, and you could see on the top the topo lines. You know, it's a, a, a flatter, more gradual grade than on 222. You can go ahead. And this one is 248. As you can see, we have the most excavation to do on 248. So 248, again, is going to be a capping project when you go through to development, right? So we'll talk about the RFP that's going out for a developer, but when the developer comes in, we're gonna work with him to do the final cap. And what that could be is buildings, pavement, soil, and landscaped areas. But again, along the edge there, we're gonna do an engineered control. Now that engineered control can be incorporated into the river walk when, when we um, get to that point where you're designing. And the biggest part of the release here on 248, as you can see, is near the tanks. So it's about the third tank that released and it just 
travel down with the grade. There's two catch basins over there. So they went into the catch basin and came out along the back of the retaining wall. So where that big retaining wall that bounds the property, there's some impacts beyond that that we have to go and get. And you can see in the photo here how flat it is out there. And so when we do the engineered control, that could be um, incorporated again into any kind of river walk you have. All right. So I talked about the yard sale, and this was a big deal for us because we already knew we were a little bit behind the eight ball with all the time going by since we got the grant and inflation going up and COVID and the cost. So this out of the box thinking to do this yard sale and advertise and get this contractor to come in and do it for nothing um, was great for us. We looked at it like we just saved 150,000 to go towards the remediation. And you can go ahead. That was just done recently, by the way, too. Um, we finished January of this year. So then we're updating the cost estimate, right? We're taking everything that we know about the site. Now the tanks are gone, and we're updating the cost estimate to plan to go out to bid and then get the bids in and see if we have enough money. And then what would we would be able to do for remediation, or how do we get more funding? And so this is a 2021 updated cost i believe we did it in august and um what we came out with and on this cost estimate we included the pavement now with decd sometimes they look at pavement as a construction cost however we were trying to make a case here that we're using it for our cap so can we get funding for that our cost estimate with the paving, the low side came to 1.6, that was the low side, 2.3 for the high side, given all the unknowns with COVID. And so um, the, what we provided here too was a long range of engineer costs, LEP costs to do all that capping and an A2 survey and legal fees. So we tried to get a real number in there and the total estimated project cost at that point, 1.9 to 2.6. 45% of that cost was paving, right? It costs a bundle to pave now. And um, 10 to 15% was LEP and engineering cost. So go ahead. Okay. We wrote the bid specs, we went out to bid. We got four bids in and here they are. What we did in forming the bid is we came up with a wish list. Let's put everything in there. Let's include the demo of the shed, taking out the tank. Let's take the truck scale out of the ground. So this was really, I called it the Chinese menu. <laughs> so I put everything in there that we could possibly want. And what are the things I've experienced in a project that we might need that I want to get a locked in cost so I don't have to worry about it surprising me and then being at the contractor's whim of what he wants to give me for a price. So we put together this bid list knowing it was above what we were really going to do, but it covered us. And so when we got the bids in, low bid 1.4 million, high bid 1.7 million, and when we averaged them, 1.6 million. Uh, I patted myself on the back. <laughs> it was close. <laughs> so we had to do a bid evaluation and the grant is state funding. We have to follow the DECD or State of Connecticut bidding guidelines and what that says in there verbatim, the lowest qualified bidder gets the job. So what's qualified? We ask for things, references, we're gonna check them. Financial statements, you have to be DAS pre-qualified. We have a full list and you have to check those boxes. The low bid met those. So we send everything up to DECD. Okay, you got your lowest qualified bidder. You're approved to send them a notice to proceed. And so that's what we worked through in the last couple days is to send them a notice to proceed. But for what? You can go ahead to the next slide. Out of the bid form, and we had great discussions about this, 
How do we use the limited funds? We have 850 something thousand dollars. <laughs> so let's award to the penny, right? <laughs> what bid items? And I said at that time, listen, you are gonna put out an RFP for a developer for 248. It has the most contamination. The property value is upside down. You'll have a hard time getting developer interest unless you go in and dig out that soil, spend your money there, that's the most bang for your buck. The developer's gonna come in, he'll have interest, we'll get the property right side up, he will come in and spend his money there. And so that was the goal of awarding these bid items. It's mostly 248 that we're gonna be focusing on. And the total of those bid items is $853,500. I think we have 854.93. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so next steps. Again, I told you we just are sending out the notice to proceed. They're gonna come in, they're gonna get their permits for completing all the work. We anticipate they're gonna start February, March, and it's gonna be a quick one. We're gonna be done by early summer, in and out. The RFP is being issued for a developer on 248 Brownstone Ave. And again, it's important to get that property right side up. The liability protection you guys secured on these properties passes to the developer when he comes in. That, the grant fund, getting the uh, property right side up and a plan in the community behind it, you really have momentum on this, so you're gonna do well, okay? And then future phases. So I always like to give a little added value and leave you with some food for thought, right? Construction of the parking lots that you wanna do, 222, 230. <coughs> Supporting development on 248 Brownstone Ave and other potential redevelopment. So not only do you wanna do the river walk, you got the deep port dock there, right? It's a um, they were shipping brownstone. Imagine the size of the ships, right? So you have that, you own that now. When we went for this project in front of DEP, they were really interested in that deep port dock and they said, hey, listen, we don't wanna convolute your brownfield project, so we won't talk about it now, but when you're ready, come see us again. We have some funding mechanisms, so keep that in mind. And the pipeline from 248 Brownstone Ave, Port Oil, that travels all the way down Brownstone Avenue, cuts in on 55 Brownstone Avenue, which is B&B Petroleum. That's where it connected to the Buckeye. It was disconnected, it was cleaned, it was tightness tested, and it just sits there. There was talk about, in the future, you plan to do sewer replacement over there, some sewer work. That's a great opportunity because the sewer line runs right along the pipeline. If you're gonna plan for removal of that pipeline, try to piggyback it with another project you have going on there. And funding may be available, right, through the American Recovery Plan. Um, the grants that are out right now are, are tremendous. The um, DECD, right, they're they're always having their grant rounds, spring, fall, and DEP for the, uh, the DOC. They're interested and they have funding sources. And DEP also offers trail grants, right? So for your river walk. Um, and there are other sources. So this came to me yesterday in the EPA blast. They just put $1.5 billion in the EPA Brownfield program out of you know, the recovery plan that they're doing. So. There's a lot of funding right now coming through. And if you read the definition, it says rural, small town, anybody, right? So I think these are great sources. You could go ahead. Told you I'd try to be quick. Did you kind of game start? <laughs> All right, so I'm ready, fire away. Who has questions? Oh, come on, I couldn't yep. answer them all. Yep. Done? Don't scare me, Don. Don's been in this business way longer than me. I think he has a two-digit LEP number. <laughs> Come on up, Tom.
I saw the uh, timeline uh, you're to be done by summer. Yeah. Does that mean that that property can be used after that? 248? Yes, or any of them. Yes, um, in fact, 222 and 230 can be used by Brownstone Discovery Park to continue parking. Okay. Two. And, yeah. And 248? And 248, once we do our cleanup, you know, it, it can be used, but what would you use it for? There's nothing there, it's empty until you get your developer on board. If well, you had a plan, well, that's what I have a question on. Yeah? What can we build in there? I mean, are we going to be able to build, say, a bulkhead like Middletown did and fill in there, or is that going to be out of the question? So, permitting is a big thing, and you say build like Middletown did. So, Middletown's riverfront, I just went through full permitting for remediation and bank stabilization. So, if you've been down to the Columbus Point and you see that bank stabilization, a lot of permitting. Um, we had to go through a lot to get that done. So to answer your question in the short amount of time, you could do anything with time and money, right? Um, so what are the chances? Go, I, I can't tell you that, right? That's a consultation with DEEP. Are they gonna let you put a bulkhead there? Well, we're, we're talking- behind it? I'm not sure. We're talking about a river walk. Yeah. What, what are we looking at? What kind of walk is this gonna be? Is this something built up, wood, or is this filled? Tell me, right? What, I'm a, what, the, what are they gonna let us put there? I'm an LEP, I'm not a developer, I'm not even an engineer. So as far as what that's gonna be constructed of, out of my wheelhouse, out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> but whatever plan they come up with, because we're doing planning engineered control, we would have to work with that. Right now, DEP has agreed that the existing conditions there, the way they are, it's um, vegetated slope, um, they're allowing us to use that as the engineered control. Now, with the way the grade is, we always looked at it like you'll need to be at the top of the slope for your river walk anyway. For you to get down to the water, you would have to do something like Middletown did that was a $2.6 million DECD grant. And they used the rocks, right? They made them like steps down to the water, but behind that, everything's capped. We have, you know, a cap, a liner going over the impacted soil, and so we built that there. They're able to use that. You could certainly do something like that, but it's engineering and permitting. Okay, yeah. so the, on 248, there's, uh, I'm assuming that was a retention wall that's down there right now? Um, there is a large retaining wall that was built around the tanks in the um, facility proper, I'll call it, where they did the refueling. To me, it served more of a containment, right? A secondary containment and a flood right. wall. So you is don't that have to have that. You can take that out. So where was the, where's the fill going to go that you're talking about? Um, what fill? We're not filling. There's no fill going in We're there whatsoever. We're not filling. You would so be doing paving. However, if you're not paving, and it, I believe that this was brought to the focus group, and Don, you know this, if you're not paving, then yes, you have to have a clean soil cap. Our original plan called for moving some soils around, right? If you had a developer, he came in with a plan and he said, hey, I'm only doing the building and the parking over here. I want to have landscape over here. We would have to consolidate all that soil. In my 2016 OPC, it called for consolidation. But we haven't gotten far enough along with a redevelopment plan for me to remediate to your development, right? So I'm remediating with what I have. I know I have significantly impacted soil with petroleum. I'm going to dig that out. And above and beyond that, a cap in there has to be worked with whatever developer comes in. Okay, so you were, um, if a developer comes in and wants to put something in, can they put a building in there? Sure. And the slope is gonna be dropping down because they can't bring any fill in. Correct. So that's an AE, FEMA flood That's zone, right. so how 
That what is this building? What's the height going to be above 15 yeah. feet? That's right. Mm -hmm. Let me, another example, right? I feel like the queen of Middletown. <laughs> Canoe Club, right? We're working <laughs> on it right now. Want to revamp. We got Eli's coming in, right? They're going to run a restaurant out of there. They're serving ice cream out windows, right? They got a whole work program for kids. The flood zone is a foot above the second floor, right? So how do we do this? Well, my engineers and my floodplain manager are working on a concept. How do, how do we do this? Dry proof, flood proofing, wet flood proofing. If you're building the way it is now, you have to put all of your utilities up Dry flood proofing is you build some kind of wall that the waters can't even come in. The wall you have on 248 right now could serve that purpose. If you take it out, all your stuff goes up in elevation. <laughs> when we approached DECB about the first round of funding for this, we talked about a waterfront restaurant, right? And I saw the focus group responses to what they envisioned, and they talked about a waterfront restaurant. We use Blue Ore as an example, right? Building it up, you could have storage on the first floor. As long as it's storage, that can be moved out. Maybe it supplies. Um, you can have parking, right? But all of your utilities, any kind of fully occupied space, has to be above the flood elevation there. Does that answer your question, how yes. we build the building? So I'm, a, I'm assuming a developer is going to understand all this when they're going into this? He should. He should have his professionals in place when he's looking at the property. And the first thing they're going to do is where are your environmental reports? And from the first report you read, you're going to see that in there, right? It's in the floodplain. So, so I'm hearing river walk. So we build some type of, type of walk along the river. It would be nice to have boats to be able to come up there, yeah. but it doesn't sound like we're going to get close enough to the water to do this? Well, there are many things, time and money, right? If you decide down the road that, hey, we want to remove some of this and we want to put a nice stairwell, very wide promenade right down to the water, people can sit on the steps. You go in and you take care of the environmental there as you're doing that construction piece. Anything that we do now, even the environmental land use restriction, and this is far stretched, but I'm gonna tell you this. We're putting an environmental land use restriction on it to say no residential use. Let's say a developer comes forward and he says, I want all three properties and I wanna do residential. There's nothing stopping him from releasing that environmental land use restriction, cleaning it up to the residential standard and building what he wants. But it's unlikely because of the cost would outweigh what he would recoup from the development. And he couldn't fill. Right, but he could build a flood proof structure. So we talked about dry flood proofing and the wall could serve that. There's another method of flood proofing. It's called wet flood proofing. And when we were designing the new boathouse for Middletown's Riverfront, this is where I learned about this. We had to have breakaway walls and we had to be able to let the water flow in and flow out. And that was required, what required in a floodplain. So that's how we built or designed the structure. So we were able to have water flow in, only boats were stored in that floodplain area and water would flow out. It's always doable, time and money. Okay, I guess, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at this river walk that's going to take up space, and then I see, on 248, I see this wall that's already down there. Yeah. So, I mean, we keep moving back, and if you're going to put a building in there, you're going to be really limited on how you're going to get a building in there, because it's going to slope off. Yes. If you walk out there now in the winter where there's no leaf on the trees and you see, if you walk on the top of the grade, you can almost see a river walk up there. There may be a spot like on 230 where the grade is lower or on 248 where eventually you might say, hey, this is where we want our water access. And so you're gonna go in and you're gonna do the work to create your water access. 
But for now, existing conditions with the funding you have, we can leave those existing conditions, be compliant with DEP, and make that happen with your current funding. Right? Okay. Don's a rich man. He's going to come <laughs> up with the dough. <laughs> I guess that's uh, in these the uh, you're saying that nothing can be done to the material that's there there's uh, gravel like up at the top part right behind that block building there's yep. gravel and tar up there's there. there's gravel so. tar everywhere as part of the bid specs what I wanted them to do because it's <coughs> so hard to get um, backfill paving right tilt pond you it, it's hard to get it and it costs so much I wanted them to go out there and reclaim everything on the surface and reuse it, right? Reclaim it on site, use it as your base and pave over, which save you so much money. So that is the way I wrote the bid specs, but we are not doing the paving with the money we have right now. One other last question. You sure? I hope. <laughs> I'm sure I'll have others later. I'm gonna drink uh, after if, this. If, uh, I, I know of my dealings with floodplains in the past was, that if you dig out dirt from a floodplain, you have to put it in that same, yes. it has to be moved, but it can't be filled. So in 248, if you dug out there, can it stay on that property in How another location? DP says, don't make any more floodway. That, right? As much as they don't want you to fill a floodplain, they don't want you to make more floodway. If you are filling in your floodplain, if you have to, and it could be done, you have to make compensatory storage somewhere else, right? I, with the boat house in Middletown, I'm sorry, sorry I keep going back to that, but you guys are most familiar with Middletown's riverfront. With that boat house, it, the original design was very large, 87,700 square foot, three-story, state-of-the-art premier boathouse. If we were going to build that, we had to make compensatory storage for that entire footprint up to the flood, huge amount. What I said to DEP and got an agreement with is as we are doing the remediation of all the properties that are brownfields along their riverfront, we're making compensatory storage so that they can build a, a boathouse. They decided not to build the big one. We've scaled that down. They're gonna put it in between the existing boathouses and canoe club restaurant in the parking lot that's there. But we will have to create that compensatory storage. With this bank stabilization project I did at Columbus Point and lopping off the hill that's there, I'm halfway to my compensatory storage. We're working on Peterson Oil next in Middletown. I'm building the rest of my compensatory storage there when I'm doing my remediation. So, your developer comes in, he wants to fill on 248. Is there the opportunity to create compensatory storage on 220 or 230? Maybe, but that's a whole engineering evaluation you would have to go through. Time and money, you could do anything. Love you, Don. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Please. You, now the plan that you are proposing with the bid, would it be the piece of property you're going to finish in cap? Is that essentially going to be flat? Yes. I ask that because you had mentioned that there's a concrete platform that's PCB contaminated that sits above grade. About a foot and a half so above grade. So then presumably if you're not digging that out, to, bring, to make that area flat, you're going to have to bring everything up to that grade or that's, higher, correct? That's just it. And as part of my last um, you know, discussion with the town before we solidified the scope, you know, do we want to go through engineering evaluation? The fact that we're holding off on the parking and why I added it to my last slide about package all this other stuff up as another project and go in for funding. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think. You may have to take out that slab. It's very thick, right? You, the way they made that is those six petroleum tanks that were on there, very high two-story cylinders. That slab was to hold them down in case they got a flood. That slab is very thick, so it's not like we could chip off the top and leave the rest. 
that has to come out. Do you out. know if it's reinforced as well? Uh, it is. We had a heck of a time drilling through it. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Uh, any? Nice. Uh, Amy, I just quick yeah. question: the two 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 thirty. Any, what exactly is being done with with this project? Are we? Is it strictly two forty eight, or is it? It is with the money mm -hmm. we have available. Um, again, I didn't want to invest some or put some of the money in two forty eight and not get it to the point where you could get developer interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 222 and 230 are already being used actively for what you plan to use it for. It's just it doesn't look as pretty as if you have nice parking and, you know, with the parking comes the engineering. You have to have a grading plan. What about your storm drainage? You have no storm drainage over there now. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be kind to let all that storm water run off into the Connecticut River. We wouldn't be allowed to do that. So that engineering evaluation should be wrapped up in with the paving on another project. Do we have any questions from online? Anyone? No? Hmm. And we're working on the RFP that's going to go out. Do you want to talk about that at, at all? I don't know too much about it, but DECD, when we asked for the additional funding, they said, we'll give it to you, but we want you to put out an RFP for a developer. I had just finished one with Bill Warner down in Haddam for his brownfield project, Scoville Ho, and so I used that an exam as an example, sent it over. Uh, he got developer interest. In fact, tomorrow's my meeting with the developer, right? He got a $1.8 million grant from DECD, because he got a developer interested, to do the cleanup for that project. Anyone? Okay, I'll go home and watch April. myself. April. Oh. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know, so you talked about putting out more um, possible grant money for 222 and 230. Is that something we could be doing now or do we need to wait until 248 is completed? No, nope. you can do it now. And in fact, I believe in the last month, I sent two grant uh, applicate, well, grant um, opportunities over. One right now is called the Community Challenge Grant and that is through DECD. And again, it's part of an economic driver create jobs they have things like livability and you promoting access to the water outdoor activity could fall in all of that another one that i thought was interesting is fema was offering to the local cogs money for projects and i was like oh floodplain projects but it wasn't it was one of these economic stimulus um, packages. So uh, Middletown did apply for uh, Remington Rand and for their canoe club project. So those were two mechanisms I forwarded them over as, you know, hey, look at these, you could have an opportunity. But my recommendation is package all that up. Your dock, your river walk, the paving, maybe your developer comes in and he says, hey, I want to do this and this, and it requires management of impacted soil that didn't require excavation but he still has to deal with it to do his footings or whatever your money can help him with that yeah Thank you. you're welcome anyone well i definitely appreciate all of you coming out and everyone that's listening via zoom yeah thank you amy and uh and Thank you, Amy, and also thank you to the uh, Brownfields Redevelopment Focus Group for all of your work on this uh, over the last two years. You guys have done a, a really, really great job, and uh, thank you for all your work. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's good to have you guys here and on Zoom. So um, does any, anybody else have any comments? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Yeah. <laughs> All right, John, John, Sean made the motion. John seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
هستند.